Okay, well, the numbers are pretty well stabilized now, which is great. We're just uh, pushing on the 50 mark. So welcome to this seminar from the uh, UCL Institute for Sustainable Resources. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome our speaker today, uh, Antonio Pedro. Um, I've known uh, Antonio because we're colleagues together on the uh, United Nations Environment Programs International Resource Panel. And we work together on the Mineral Resource Governance Report, which he is going to be talking about today. Um, he knows an enormous amount more about everything to do with mining than I do. Uh, and I learned that uh, very much uh, during our work together on the IRP. Um, he's a mineral exploration geologist. He joined the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in 2001. He currently directs its office for Central Africa based in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Prior to joining uh, ECA, he was the Director General of the Southern and Eastern African Mineral Center in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. He's Managing Director of several companies in Mozambique and Deputy National Director of the country's Geological Survey. One of his most significant achievements was to spearhead the formulation of the Africa Mining Vision, which was adopted by the African Union in February 2009 as the continental framework for the sustainable development of the extractive sector in Africa. So he brought all that huge experience of sustainable development in respect of mining uh, to the International Resource Panel um, for the report that he's going to talk about today. Um, he's a member of the Leadership Council of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and uh, he lectures at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment on Extractive Industry and Sustainable Development Executive Training Program, um, and that's at Columbia University, where he's a faculty member. So I could go on, uh, but we only have him for an hour, and I'd much rather that he did the talking rather than me. So. Uh, uh, Pedro, it's a huge uh, honor and pleasure to introduce you to UCL, albeit virtually, and I very hope that one day you'll be able to visit us in person, and we're very much looking forward to your lecture. So over to you now then, please. Yeah, thank you, Professor Paul Aikens, for this opportunity. I'd like to also thank UCL. Um, as you've indicated, I mean, this was really a very uh, collective exercise of producing uh, this uh, report uh, for the International Resources uh, Panel. Uh, the title, I mean, says it all. So mineral resources governance in the 23rd, 21st century, uh, gearing distracted industries towards sustained development. So I will now share the, 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 the screen um, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, go through it smoothly and offering uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, discuss, I think, what's happening here. Is it already? Yes, we are, we are seeing your screen, Pedro. So I think everything is okay. Okay, but it's a little bit, let me see if I can manage it somehow, because it's in slide three. Okay, good, all right. So. So thank you very much again. Um, so the, the, this is a joint uh, effort of uh, a couple of uh, IRP members, including Professor Paul Lekins. And um, it, it's an exercise uh, that was motivated with a very, on a very serious question. Uh, first, the understanding that uh, mineral resources uh, can play an important role uh, to the achievement of the uh, SDGs, uh, but uh, that requires a couple of fundamentals, one of which is uh, the good governance and transparency and so on. Uh, so based on that uh, understanding, we went on into interrogating whether the existing governance instruments are, are capable of providing uh, that, that outcome, namely uh, an increased 
and sustained contribution of the extractive uh, sector to the achievement of the SDGs. So this, um, there's a couple of uh, reports that have uh, recognized uh, this particular um, contribution, uh, including, for example, the mapping mining to the sustained development goals atlas, which was produced by the CCSI, the Sustained Development Solutions Network, and um, UNDP, among others, that have basically recognized that indeed the extractive sector can contribute to the achievement of most of the SDGs, but it also uh, has significant negative impacts, environmental being uh, one of the most critical. Um, this uh, report uh, from the Responsible Mining Foundation, uh, Mining and the SDGs, a 2020 status update, examines uh, you know, the extent to which uh, mining corporations are internalizing the SDGs into their um, business models, and both at the operational and also at the board level. Um, and then it, it, it uh, summarizes uh, through all sorts of scorecards and, and indicators um, how companies are, 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 are doing that. There is also an interesting uh, report that was launched recently by uh, the University of Delaware and Park that recognizes that beyond uh, the um, large scale mining, artisanal small scale mining can also contribute uh, to sustained development, especially in rural environments, in rural settings. Um, as you know, artisanal small-scale mining is both uh, a poverty-driven and a poverty of alleviation uh, activity. Uh, so this particular publication uh, articulates um, what are the positive and negative contributions of, of, of mining. So the overall picture, therefore, is that mining can indeed uh, contribute to the achievement of the, uh, of the sustained development goals if it is well governed and managed. Um, this basically recognizes how um, artisanal small scale scale mining is an important sector. The latest figures suggest that we are dealing with about 40 million or so directly involved in the, in the sector, with 150 indirectly uh, benefiting or otherwise from the sector. Uh, another important um, uh, fundamental that informs our, our work and, and this particular study is a realization that um, moving forward, uh, the extractive sectors will continue to be uh, important to um, uh, mankind. So uh, in all of the different transitions that will inform the world of 2050 and 2060, uh, including the uh, energy transitions all of them are resource intensive. And then, the, so the overall question then becomes, how can we ensure uh, that the extraction of these resources will contribute to the uh, sustained development goals? Uh, how can we promote the coupling of the economic activity from environmental and social impact? So this is the overall, again, a uh, chapeau that has informed this work. Uh, the, the, the four or five, uh, slides that, that, that follow uh, basically uh, talk about the, the same uh, uh, imperative that extractive sectors are critical for us to, to sustain our lifestyles, both in the developed and in developing world. And in the case of the developing world, given uh, the, the, this, this, the, their state of development and the need to build the infrastructure that is required, minerals, uh, both solid and, uh, and, and fuel, fossil fuels will continue to be important. So what kind of framework will sustain a, 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 a continued exploitation of these resources without necessarily impacting negatively on the environment, climate change, and so on and so forth? Um, one of the major uh, um, issues of concern to everyone is the impact of the extractive sector on biodiversity. Uh, this slide uh, indicates areas uh, in which we uh, uh, have significant impacts of mining on the biodiversity. 
So a major concern, an area that we've interrogated through this study. Um, again, um, this uh, identifies some of the uh, most critical um, minerals um, moving forward, uh, both uh, if you look at take into consideration uh, uh, increases in population. I mean, the projections are that by 2050, we'll have uh, about 10 or so billion people. Uh, then the question becomes, how are we going to, to fit this uh, uh, many number of, of, of people? Uh, and hence the, uh, the importance of uh, fertilizer minerals like potash and phosphate, whose uh, I mean, the, the scenarios here suggest that consumption will, will increase. And of course, uh, all, everything that, that you will find in, in, in cement uh, the, the, um, will, will uh, which is required for us to build infrastructure, build the cities, the roads, especially in developing uh, uh, countries, again, justifies why um, we have this uh, grass, uh, the upward uh, consumption of, of, of cement. Um, the same applies to uh, a couple of the other minerals that, that are there. They just reflect uh, that uh, whatever scenario we're looking at, resource intensity will be a feature. So from uh, our own uh, reports, this is the global resource outlook uh, that uh, the IRP produced, uh, the same, the same uh, uh, message uh, that uh, the use of natural resources uh, will increase uh, as before we reach the plateau. And the resource intensity theory suggests that until countries reach uh, $16,000 per capita, uh, we, you will continue to see resource intensity. Then after that, there's some flattening and, uh, and of course, a reduction in consumption. Um, the same message uh, uh, viewed from a different perspective. So then um, going back to the core question um, and uh, the fundamentals that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the first one is that we will not be able to promote sustained development in the sector if the, uh, we do not improve governance in its own uh, uh, dimensions. So there, there is a, 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 an effort that has been made uh, ever since the 2000s uh, through the mining for the uh, NMSD project that Luke Danielson led and that produced the Breaking New Ground um, publication, a seminar publication that basically articulated the, the uh, fundamentals on, on the, the linking extractives with sustained development and the pathways to achieving that. So that has uh, motivated quite a lot of uh, uh, efforts across the globe to try and artic articulate the responses. And uh, uh, it, our own report has mapped more than 90 of such initiatives that, I mean, uh, we can link to the MMSD project. Uh, this includes, I mean, the after mine vision, Professor Paul has mentioned this as being the framework that uh, um, Africa has formulated to try and promote sustained development in, in, in the sector. The Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, Global Reporting Initiative, you name it. And the International Council of Mining and Metals, which is the apex body of, um, let's say, most of the major companies, again, um, uh, provides quite a lot of support to the, the, the member companies into identifying how to promote sustainable extraction of uh, mineral resources. Um, and uh, all of this effort uh, has been um, uh, underpinned uh, in the context of um, uh, mining companies with an effort to uh, acquire a social license to operate, uh, which um, uh, were designed uh, to uh, address um, grievances, concerns, mostly at uh, project level. Uh, coming from local community and other stakeholders. Uh, and, and, uh, and this has been uh, most of the effort that, that uh, has informed the articulation of um, uh, efforts to achieve sustainable development in the extractive industry 
for companies has been predicated on this on the quest to secure a social license to, to operate. So we've argued that with the uh, uh, adoption of the um, sustained development goals and uh, the need to um, uh, promote um, sustained development uh, beyond, uh, let's say the project level, the operational level, there is a need for a, a different uh, framework a framework that is uh, anchored on um, a bottom, uh, quadruple bottom line approach where success, success is measured not only on the environmental, on the economic and financial outcomes, but also in the adherence to the highest governance and transparency standards, as well as environmental and social considerations. So uh, this paradigm uh, shift uh, is what has informed uh, the report that we are presenting here today on behalf of the IRP. We've also recognized uh, that uh, many of the efforts uh, that I've mentioned earlier, the 90 year plus initiatives uh, that uh, I've uh, indicated, uh, were sector specific, were fragmented in nature, uh, which uh, again is not compatible with the, uh, the SDGs and the indivisibility a concept that informs the uh, SDGs. Um, so uh, again, uh, in, in most uh, uh, situations, the social license to operate again was uh, meant to address uh, very context specific uh, situations, grievances at the operational level, at the local level, whereas of course the SDGs are a much broader uh, a spatial and temporal uh, concept. So uh, uh, how to, um, uh, to, to, to translate the, the quest uh, for uh, that um, uh, connectivity across spatial and temporal scales uh, became therefore one of the, our uh, major preoccupations as we interrogate the state of governance in the extractive sector. And, and that uh, uh, led us to uh, propose as a framework what they call the Sustained Development License to Operate, a framework that has built on, on, on all of the uh, uh, previous work that was done since the, the, the end of the 90s um, and, and uh, built on this uh, social license to operate, but it, it takes it uh, to a, a, a larger, uh, um, uh, to, to a broader, uh, I mean, broader sort of spatial and temporal uh, framework, uh, encompassing uh, uh, such principles as the need to ensure intergenerational equity, uh, among other factors. Uh, a, a framework that recognizes that uh, achieving sustained development is a joint responsibility, not only of mining companies and governments, but also uh, of, of, of a couple of, of other stakeholders, including uh, institutional investors, um, consumers, uh, and so on and so forth. So, and uh, this is the, the framework that, that, that we, uh, we propose as, as the, uh, the bridge to the sustained development uh, uh, era, the SDG uh, era. So uh, the, um, the sustained development license to operate um, is based um, on the 17 SDGs. It takes into consideration uh, the, the, the targets and, and then uh, it uh, defines a, a couple of uh, key principles uh, that should inform uh, its operationalization. Um, including uh, the need to reconcile interests both of, uh, of all of the stakeholders that I've mentioned earlier, uh, the, the need to take into consideration uh, um, the imperative of the coupling, uh, the need to reduce uh, the uh, energy intensity of uh, the uh, extractive sector, and, uh, and also to secure uh, shared value creation. Uh, for all the different stakeholders that are involved in the sector, including local communities, uh, indigenous uh, uh, people, and so on and so forth. 
So um, we've also argued, therefore, um, that um, uh, this SDA law is a, a living uh, framework in, in the sense that um, it has to, it's, it's a dynamic, a context specific uh, articulation of, of uh, the, 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 the principles that, that are enshrined in the SDGs um, based on uh, uh, a practical identification of uh, 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 options. Uh, building on best practices as perceived by as, as many as possible uh, stakeholders. So uh, in this particular slide, uh, we are offering some of the pathways with the, uh, to the operationalization of the SDA law. Um, first is um, a deep dive into some of the, um, of the targets in the SDGs, uh, identifying which ones in particular uh, will be of uh, uh, interest uh, to uh, our stakeholders. Uh, and then uh, based uh, on the, uh, those principles that are identified earlier, then we offer the, the policy as uh, options uh, and, and then that is operationalized accordingly. So, um, a little bit more uh, on um, some of those uh, principles uh, which I've introduced earlier. Um, one, of course, is uh, the, uh, this key, key principle of secure shared value creation. And of course, uh, value, um, whatever constitutes value uh, uh, is, depends on, on the stakeholder. So one important exercise uh, uh, to start with is to understand uh, uh, exactly what are those uh, value dimensions. Uh, there is a, a, an inter interesting piece of work from the World Economic Forum, the Minerals Value Management Framework, that have articulated those, uh, some of those value dimensions. Those are seven in the context of the uh, MNV, uh, Minerals Value Management Framework, uh, and they include the folks, revenue streams. So how to secure a fair distribution of, of, uh, of the re revenues, so taxes, um, um, the return to shareholders and so on and so forth. Another important concept is to um, uh, secure more uh, value addition, uh, local processing of, of minerals, so deepening of value, cha uh, value chains in home countries. This is something that the developing South uh, uh, is fighting for in negotiating contracts. And of course, uh, at the same time, we need to secure environmental uh, uh, um, friendly uh, operations, climate fr fr friendly operations, uh, and ensure that all of this happens without uh, aggressive disruption of the social fabric of the communities in which mining uh, uh, operates. So uh, on the policy options, again, there are uh, many uh, out there, uh, and um, the African mining vision is one of, of them, uh, but there are, are many uh, uh, described in the, in the, um, in the report. Um, the idea of on the, the issue of uh, building on best practices, uh, we've uh, documented also what is the through the different initiatives, what is um, being um, developed as instruments, as initiatives uh, on which we could uh, try and reduce uh, some of the fragmentation that uh, we've, uh, we've uh, come across when we, do, when we did the mapping of the, the, the frameworks and initiatives. And one of the things uh, that I'll come back to later is the call that we're making for an upward harmonization of international standards with a view to re re uh, addressing uh, one major problem, which is uh, initiative fatigue, and also uh, ensure that there is a greater policy uptake and uh, um, uh, internalization of some of these key principles uh, in, the, in the initiatives and standards, international laws, regulations, and practice. So uh, this, again, uh, tries to provide additional uh, details 
uh, about some of the policy options. For example, an important preoccupation in the extractive industry is at, uh, to avoid single uh, use infrastructure. As you know, in many of our mining jurisdictions, infrastructure is built mainly to, to service uh, the, the mining industry. But uh, for many developing countries, this is a luxury that, that they cannot afford. So the conversation with the, with the mining companies, uh, with the investors, therefore, is how to secure uh, greater access of this infrastructure without necessarily disrupting mining operations. This requires uh, conversations, dialogue, an important principle that informs the SDLO. So, um, uh, what are the practical implications um, of the um, of the SDLO? Uh, I, I indicated earlier one is uh, the need to um, secure that uh, a win-win outcome across different jurisdictions and different stakeholders. For example, um, if you are in Europe and if you if you look at uh, policy frameworks like the. EU raw material initiative, you see that it's predicated on the security, securitization of supply, which is, uh, of course, uh, a justifiable uh, um, uh, imperative for Europe. Uh, whilst uh, if you are in the developing south, uh, creating maximum value out of the, the resource endowments is one of their uh, major uh, uh, development imperative. And that's uh, some of the pathways to achieving that is to secure more uh, local processing, value addition, promoting resource-based industrialization. How to reconcile uh, those different uh, uh, imperatives becomes, of course, critical. You will see that later we are suggesting that uh, platforms to achieving that. Um, artisanal small-scale mining is a neglected sector, yet it plays an important role both in producing some of the critical minerals for the transitions, for example, to, uh, um, to um, a green uh, economy, uh, the energy transitions, uh, many of the, the cobalt, the lithium of this world that is required for uh, battery minerals are produced by artisanal small scale miners. So how to ensure through all sorts of processes, including formalization, that they are, uh, are also, uh, that they are not marginalized. Um, and uh, one approach, of course, is um, to um, ensure that there is a greater recognition of artisanal small scale mining that is integrated in the uh, regional uh, and, uh, um, and local development plans. So those are some of the practical implications and, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll provide, I'll provide more information on this, as, uh, on those issues as I, uh, I finalize the, the presentation. The report um, informed the deliberations of uh, UNEA 4. Uh, uh, UNEA 4 adopted a resolution in the resource governance, which uh, we are all uh, I mean, very, we're very pleased with this outcome because it provides uh, um, uh, the very clear uh, pathway to uh, addressing um, uh, some of the issues that we've raised uh, in terms of mobilizing the international community to uh, addressing governance issues of the structure sector in a holistic manner. So uh, the, the, this specific, uh, specific resolution on mineral resources governance uh, requested, among other things, uh, that um, uh, we should continue to collect information on the existing practices, the standards, uh, to identify gaps and, and, and uh, develop a body of, of knowledge and practice to uh, help uh, stakeholders, governments, uh, private sector uh, companies, and so on, to uh, foster uh, good governance in the extractive um, uh, industry. Um, the re there is an ongoing exercise. I mean, I will be after this meeting. I'll be jumping to a nexus dialogue that the UNEP is is uh, entertaining with a view to finding uh, solutions for UNEA five or proposing uh, options to um, uh, improve the state of governance in the extractive sector, building on UNEA four resolution. So. 
What are some of the uh, additional uh, specific options to operationalize the, uh, the, the SDLO? Um, we are um, uh, calling for an international union of agents, uh, uh, um, I mean, fashioned on the interna international energy agents, uh, which uh, would, uh, among other things, uh, could, be, could be responsible for um, uh, arbitrating uh, uh, some of the critical issues, um, the complex governance challenges that we've identified in the sector, um, including uh, the uh, problems with uh, commodity price fluctuation, which creates all sorts of havocs in uh, the, the in host countries, including macroeconomic instability. Uh, the office that I lead here in uh, Central Africa is specialized on economic diversification, and this uh, because uh, most of the countries that we cover are resource uh, dependent export countries. Uh, and uh, uh, with the drop in, in oil prices, particularly in 2014, they are now uh, under a structural adjustment program. And uh, we argue that the only way for them to get out of those vicious cycle of booms and busts is to pursue uh, um, economic diversification, addressing the structural problems that compounding the economies locally. So uh, this global uh, uh, international, this international minerals agents would have that responsibility uh, to, uh, uh, to try and arbitrate uh, some of those vex problems uh, that inform uh, uh, the extractive industry. So um, global platforms for dialogues, including, for example, uh, dialogues uh, between uh, different, um, uh, different uh, regions, regional platforms, I, mean, I could look at, for example, contemplate uh, a college of commissioners from the European Union and the uh, African Union Commission uh, that would, uh, uh, from time to time, engage into discussing uh, how to reduce uh, the uh, gaps in perception of what constitutes value uh, from the different uh, sort of uh, um, uh, viewpoints. At the national level, uh, of course, uh, the key issue is uh, how to articulate the role of extractives uh, in, uh, in, in achieving the, uh, SD, uh, the, the SDGs um, uh, through all sorts of instruments, uh, uh, including uh, um, the uh, VLRs and so on and so forth. So uh, this would require, among other things, um, uh, to undertake uh, SDLO gaps analysis um, uh, with a view to uh, identifying what needs to be uh, improved in terms of the existing body of laws, regulations, standards and practice, and so on and so forth. And then, and then do the necessary adjustments accordingly. So I, I had mentioned earlier that uh, the SDA law and the report uh, recognizes the value of all of these initiatives, the body of work that has been done since the 90s. So uh, um, some of the recommendations that we're putting forward as uh, um, short-term recommendations uh, call for, among other things, um, this upward harmonization uh, of existing uh, instruments. Um, I, I had uh, the, uh, the privilege of engaging uh, the principles uh, of some of the initiatives, the global uh, reporting initiatives, the um, RMDI, um, the ICMMs, ITI, and so on, into discussing the, the merits uh, of uh, doing that uh, consolidation. What are the immediate opportunities uh, out there? Uh, I will also believe that uh, uh, some of the work, like for example, the shared value initiative, uh, have uh, uh, defined uh, a series of uh, uh, approaches to um, strengthening uh, the shared value creation, uh, which provide again an opportunity for us to build on this and then elevate it uh, to uh, um, a greater uh, audiences uh, across uh, several jurisdictions. So um, the, the Equator principles, as, as you know, uh, they, play, they played a very important role in um, moving uh, the, the environmental agenda from being soft law uh, sort of um, uh, concepts to being hard law enshrined in national laws and regulations 
because of course as an incentive for you to secure financing as, as an operator or as, as a mining company, you needed to, uh, um, um, to uphold the highest environmental standards, including environment in your business models and so on and so forth. So at the country level and be, uh, building in the context of Africa, building on the African mining vision, we have developed something that we call the country mining vision which provides a step-by-step -step guide on how to uh, operationalize and domesticate the African mining vision. So this is a, a the plethora of, of, of instruments and initiatives on which we believe it's, it's possible uh, to operationalize the, 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 uh, the SDLO. So uh, I, 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 I've mentioned this discussion that we, uh, we had uh, with the, uh, the principles of the major uh, global initiatives, and, and the, the effort there was to try and uh, articulate what could uh, eventually be the value proposition of this upward consolidation. Um, so, uh, and uh, as the slide uh, suggests, uh, this required uh, um, a collective effort to try and identify what are those systemic issues uh, that, that confront uh, the sector. Uh, and it, um, so with a view to developing, I mean, uh, of course, this is one of those uh, um, words or, uh, that we, 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 we would like to use and to develop a fear of change, fear of change uh, to, to facilitate a coherent uh, approach to addressing those systemic issues. So building synergies uh, across the different uh, instruments and initiatives. Uh, to, to, with a view to perhaps uh, developing uh, or designing some smart regulation that would ultimately uh, uh, um, respond to those imperatives of, of the sustained development goals and the need to uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, these quadruple bottom uh, uh, um, uh, uh, approaches. Um, then also uh, facilitating uh, co creation. Uh, between uh, or among uh, everyone involved uh, in the uh, formulation and implementation of the, of the different uh, initiatives. Uh, I've, I've mentioned also uh, the issue of initiative fatigue. Um, so how to reduce the cost of uh, compliance, how to address administrative burdens, especially in very uh, fragile administration that don't have the capacity to respond to all of these uh, requirements, reporting and otherwise that are associated with many of these initiatives, EITI and so on and so forth. So we, are, we believe that consolidation would address some of these issues. So I, I believe I've, I've reached uh, the end of this uh, presentation. I'll be uh, um, available to respond to uh, any questions. Uh, and thank you very much again for, for your time and patience. Over to you, um, uh, Paul. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Pedro, for uh, a real overview of the very many positive things that are going on in the um, is uh, related to the issue of mining. As you say, absolutely critical that we resolve these issues. There's no transformation to a low carbon future without many of these metals and minerals. And it's an absolute imperative that the way that we procure them contributes to the sustainable development of the countries from which they come. Um, so that's great. And uh, we've got uh, some questions already. I'll just remind people, um, please <clears throat> do put your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of the screen when you, when you hover over the screen. Um, but we've already got three of them. And I'm going to start with uh, quite a long question from Destiny Afu, who writes that uh, she is joining from Cameroon. And um, that's one of the great pleasures of these Zoom meetings is that uh, in, uh, in the days when we had these meetings face to face, obviously we would not have had people uh, being able to join from Cameroon. And uh, anyway, Destiny, you're very welcome. And uh, Destiny says that, uh, it's not always clear whether mining brings economic and social benefits to the host countries. And she mentions a number of problems such as poor governance, corruption, exploitation, etc., um, along with uh, alleged human rights abuses 
near or around mines, and I have to say it's very often more than alleged, it's very often proved, as we know. And um, she would like you to talk a bit about the international regulations and institutions that either are or might be set in place to mitigate this phenomenon. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to, to hear that uh, someone from uh, Cameroon is, 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 is attending, is participating in this uh, conversation. Yes, yes, Italy, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, it, it, indeed, uh, it is uh, not um, uh, obvious um, that extractive industry can contribute to uh, sustained development, can contribute to uh, alleviating uh, poverty can contribute to um, uh, ensuring that uh, our countries are, are, are developed and so on and so forth. Uh, hence, um, uh, our, one of our key messages in this report that this requires uh, good governance. This requires the, the adherence to the highest standards of, of governance and transparency and so on and so forth. But um, it is easier said than, than done. Uh, uh, we argue that unless we um, build domestic accountability and appetite for good governance, the needle may not change. So what do I mean by uh, uh, so raising the appetite for, for uh, good governance. It means that um, we as, as citizens, uh, as interested parties, uh, have a responsibility also to um, contribute to good governance. In many of these mining uh, jurisdictions, we have what we call the political underdevelopment, where um, a limited few, uh, as it were, uh, capture the rents, uh, and, and because uh, the um, contribution to taxes of local communities is, is not that significant, the tax to GDP ratios are, are, are insignificant in many of these uh, mining countries, they can live without uh, having to go back to their constituencies uh, and to, to respond uh, to, to their demands and, 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 and so on and so forth. So um, uh, addressing that is an important thing. The other is um, building, I mean, your question was, what is, what's the role of the international community on this? Uh, for example, the uh, OECD has uh, developed um, very good uh, guidance on, on, uh, um, on, for, for contract negotiations, uh, on the design of contracts, which um, uh, uh, a source of um, good as a reference um, knowledge that countries can, can uh, borrow from with a view to strengthen their own capacity uh, to negotiate better. Because that, again, is one of the major problems, the asymmetry of power and information uh, in many of these uh, typical negotiations between uh, mining companies and uh, governments, you will see that the mining companies are, uh, they come with a barrage of lawyers, a very strong, uh, 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 well equipped, uh, um, whilst uh, the typical government will go there with two or three lawyers that sometimes are not well informed about the subject matter. So building that capacity becomes uh, an important uh, part of the effort to try and ensure that extractive industries uh, um, contribute more to, 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 to development locally. Um, so um, th th that's part of it. Uh, our earlier indicated that in the context of Africa, we've already formulated the African mining vision, which provide guidance on, on, on how to achieve that. And that is supported by uh, uh, by, account, uh, by the country mining vision uh, guidelines. Again, it's a step-by-step -step, uh, approach to uh, interrogating some of those uh, issues and the challenges that confront the sector. So I'll be available to, to uh, uh, engage with you since you are in Cameroon. Please come to my office and we can talk more about that.
Over to you. Um, well, thanks, Pedro. And you obviously have quite a fan club in Cameroon because we have another questioner from uh, Cameroon. And this is Akara Eric Mbita. And um, he's asking a question about what uh, are the various platforms put in place by international institutions so as to curb the lack of transformation technology within the mining sector within the CMAC area in Africa. I have to confess, I don't know what the CMAC area in Africa is, but you probably do. So the, the technological upgrading, that seems to be a question about that. Okay, so the CEMAC is Economic and Monetary Commission of Central African States. It groups right. about each of, those, uh, uh, of our countries here. So uh, technology transfer has been uh, um, um, one of the major uh, goals um, of uh, developing countries. You will see in a typical mining contract, uh, they will see a provision um, that calls for a gradual transfer of technology. Many of the uh, local content uh, policies uh, uh, have provisions for that. But again, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, an automatic uh, process. Um, it, 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 it requires um, an ability uh, also at the level of, uh, of the recipient uh, or the host countries to be able to enforce uh, some of those provisions that are in their uh, respective uh, contracts, uh, and sometimes that is not uh, uh, obvious. Um, as I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the major problems in many of these resource-rich countries is the lack of capacity, including of enforcing uh, what is already contained in the legal and regulatory frameworks and in the contracts as well. Um, the um, uh, issue of, of uh, uh, local content uh, is uh, is being captured at the international level. The World Bank has issued again a guidance on, on, on local content uh, that um, suggests uh, approaches to uh, addressing uh, addressing uh, addressing it. Uh, earlier, I also mentioned the, the World Economic Forum Minerals Value Management Framework and its seven value dimensions. And one of the, uh, the, the, the dimensions is uh, increased uh, local uh, uh, processing and value addition. And value addition comes with the, with the uh, transfer of technology uh, because it's about uh, deepening the value chain. Uh, it's about um, uh, changing the, um, the, the nature of the extracted industry which in many of our countries constitutes a, a, an enclave with very few linkages with the local economy. So the link, local uh, link, uh, mineral linkages program is again one of those issues where you can find a, a, a lot of guidance of that. The uh, Intergovernmental Forum in Mining and Metals, the IGF, has a lot of uh, literature on that. So again, I would encourage uh, uh, um, every, um, uh, any interested party to uh, read our report because the report comes with quite a lot of information about uh, what is available out there in terms of uh, good practice, best practices, including on issues of transfer of technology. I would, I would argue just uh, in terms of uh, the opportunities uh, uh, um, um, uh, out there is with COVID-19 and the uh, disruptions uh, in uh, global supply chains, um, local content is, is, is makes, I mean, promoting local content uh, makes business sense. So there is a paradigm shift now on how uh, local content is perceived by, by the business. Before it was considered one of those uh, uh, nuisances. I mean, the, um, uh, uh, the Ernest Wang and, and Young publication, I think it's, um, it's in 2018, considered local content as the number one uh, business risk. Today, uh, local content is considered uh, one approach uh, to uh, reducing business risk, the risk, the risk of uh, uh, arising out of disruptions of supply chains when you cannot have access to your inputs, machinery and otherwise, because uh, uh, 
uh, your ports are closed because of all of those travel uh, disruptions, uh, the disruptions in trade and so on and so forth. So if, if, if there was a, a, ever a, a, the best time to pursue local content, this is the, 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 the best time to do it, to push for, for more linkages because uh, mining companies are, are, are looking at it from a different perspective as part of their business risk uh, minimization. Over to you, uh, Paul. Yeah, well, thank you. That's really interesting. And I'm going to pick a question here from uh, Miho Taka from Coventry University, which relates to something you were saying just a bit earlier about the need for local capacities. And she asks that she observes the shortage of skilled and qualified people in Africa and developing countries more generally. And this prevents the value accruing to those countries, but also impacts on the negotiations of contracts. So what are the efforts to address this lack of local capacity and expertise? Yes, um, there are, I mean, many institutions out there, I mean, educational institutions, for example, you've made reference to the Columbia Center of Sustainable Investment, uh, the Dundee University, um, uh, the Minerals and Energy Policy uh, Center uh, offers um, training on contract negotiations, uh, offers um, um, uh, master's degree training, executive trainings, which uh, um, would uh, contribute to uh, filling the gaps, as it were. Um, uh, uh, in the good old days, um, there were all sorts of initiatives, international initiatives that aimed at, at, uh, at boosting their, 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 their capacity. Uh, the um, uh, IC for MD, I think this was an Australian initiative, contributed to building uh, capacity across many, many countries uh, in Africa and, and, and beyond. So, but that is not sufficient. Um, uh, the, Capacity uh, with a view to um, uh, generating a greater uh, value creation or shared value creation. Uh, it's important to, among other things, to boost the capacity of um, local sm small and medium enterprise to enter into the value chain. I've mentioned earlier uh, that in many of our these mining jurisdictions, we are, we are talking of I an mean, enclave sector. And one way of um, uh, um, addressing this issue is by localizing, localizing the procurement value chain. Uh, and procurement constitutes uh, in um, a typical mining project, the large one especially, about 60% of the, of the cost structure of the project. Just imagine uh, the, the value that you'd retain locally if you were able to localize the procurement value chain. But for you to be able to do that, you have to uh, boost or increase the capacity of your local suppliers. Uh, we at the level of ECA, we develop what we call National Suppliers Development Program, which is a, 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 a guidance note uh, for the governments and for the private sector to engage into meaningful, meaningful discussions uh, on how to do that. I mean, the first step, uh, of course, is first to do a skills gaps assessment. So uh, uh, profiling the, 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 the suppliers that exist in your market, uh, identifying what are their, their I mean, capacities, their, 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 their gaps, and then together with the private sector, uh, um, then uh, providing their capacity. Because again, as I, as I said earlier, COVID-19 has made this uh, much easier to pursue. Uh, 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 and that is just one of the uh, uh, many uh, uh, other uh, avenues, as it were, to address capacity gaps. Uh, so capacity gaps uh, exist also at the level of, of the mining companies, uh, uh, which um, in, in many cases, uh, in, in several cases, they are not uh, well equipped to uh, understanding the, the, uh, the, 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 the environment in which they are operating uh, to uh, reduce uh, negative impacts, environmental and social uh, and otherwise. So, and, and um, especially when commodity prices go down, the first thing that, that they uh, uh, dispose of is 
the, uh, the group of people in the environmental uh, complex. So the, the vice president uh, responsible for sustained development, I mean, they'll be the first ones to be fired because companies, of course, will be uh, concerned with bottom line issues. Uh, and, and, and yet, without those kinds of skill sets, it's impossible for many companies to be to understand better how to deliver shared value. So I would say uh, uh, capacity development uh, is not a problem only for, for developing countries, for governments, uh, it's also a problem for mining companies. And, and, and it talks to, to the, one of the key principles that I informed, I indicated earlier, that this is a joint responsibility. Um, in, for example, uh, you have, you've, I'm sure you've heard of the economic social governance factors, so the ESG factors, uh, which uh, uh, are um, uh, increasingly being uh, part in, internalized in the business model of, of, uh, of, my, of, of companies, uh, but they are not yet there uh, uh, to, in terms of um, pushing the needle, uh, advancing uh, the state of governance. The moment uh, that that becomes uh, uh, part of the DNA of, of mining companies, uh, then uh, you will see change. So that requires uh, strengthening of capacity. This requires new hybrids, uh, no, hybrid metrics, I mean, uh, where uh, these companies will be valued not only on the strength of their financial returns, but also on how they uh, embrace uh, uh, sustainable development goals in, in general. So uh, again, a joint responsibility. I mean, the market has to uh, um, respond to the companies that are behaving better and, 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 and so that uh, they will be, uh, uh, I mean, valued more, there will be a premium for the companies that will uh, behave in accordance with the SDLO as we formulated it. Over to you, uh, Paul. Yeah, Pedro, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in real trouble now because um, your talk has uh, stimulated so many questions. We've got 11 questions here and uh, you've got one minute before you said you wanted to go. My, so my first question to you is, can we, can we keep going till five past? Is that all right? Yes, I mean, I, I think we can go for another 15 minutes or so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. in that case, that's, uh, that's great. And I'm going to uh, ask questions really from Will Hayes here. And um, he's um, talking here about the Amazon basin. And I mean, this is a question which is also relevant to the artisanal and small scale mining issues, which you mentioned. And uh, he's referring to the SDG 15, Life on Land. And he asks, how do we offset the environmental damage that mining causes to fragile environments such as the Amazon basin in which gold mining has decimated parts of, for example, Madre de Dios in Peru. And of course, we all know that there's an, uh, a huge invasion of, of mining going on in Brazil as well. So, I, I mean, how, how do you see the, the remediation of these kinds of efforts? Well, the one aspect we've discussed earlier, I think the need to strengthen uh, local uh, administration, uh, because uh, in many of these countries, they have already uh, environmental rules and regulations. They would have the Environmental Protection Agency, but uh, in, in, in many cases, um, they, are, they don't have the capacity to be uh, everywhere, especially where it matters. So that is one important uh, effort that needs to be deployed. The other one, uh, which uh, we are promoting here, uh, because uh, Central Africa is the home of the Congo Basin, and the Congo Basin, just like uh, 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 the environment, uh, the, the Amazon, uh, provides uh, valuable ecological service to the rest of the world. So we are promoting natural capital accounting. We are, uh, um, we are. Uh, uh, calling for advocating for the mainstreaming of natural capital accounting in a national accounts um, so that uh, the value of this of natural capital is recognized including its ecological services beyond that we are equally calling for a rebasing of uh, the, the wealth of um, of uh, the national uh, the rebasing of national wealth uh, on um, uh, by, by taking into account 
the value of natural capital. So going beyond GDP-based metrics. Uh, so uh, with, the, with that uh, effort, uh, natural capital would become more valuable. So the efforts to protect natural capital uh, will become uh, more clear uh, because uh, in some cases, uh, countries are, uh, I mean, uh, managing tensions. Uh, between, for example, uh, the, the, the need to uh, promote exploitation of, um, uh, let's say, harvesting of, of, of forests for export timbers and the need to conserve. And, and, and in some cases, this is not uh, well understood. So we argue that natural capital accounting can be uh, a, a, a part of the agenda into uh, demonstrating what is the, the value proposition of natural capital. And, and, and then that this is an asset that you can monetize. This is an asset that you, from, from which you can secure fiscal space for you to pursue your development agenda. I mean, in, this, in our case here, I mentioned earlier, uh, Central African countries are now under structural adjustment uh, uh, sort of program uh, being administered by the IMF. And if you are, uh, I mean, and the structural adjustment means your fiscal space is very, is, is very much uh, limited, is reduced. So you rebase your economies, all of a sudden your, your wealth uh, will be uh, uh, at least theoretically uh, uh, higher. And so hence you can have more fiscal space to pursue, to secure, uh, to pursue investments for infrastructure and so, and so on, which can then open up uh, uh, more, uh, more, more sectors of the economy. So uh, providing that clear evidence uh, that um, protecting the environment makes business sense as a country, uh, again, is part of the agenda that needs to be pursued uh, to, 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 to change the, 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 uh, what's happening on the ground. So um, there are other, we also call in our report for the mainstreaming of uh, strategic environmental assessments, uh, where at the macro level, we interrogate uh, whether uh, mining uh, uh, represents a, a higher um, uh, value uh, option as a land, land use option. Uh, so protecting, again, protecting the environment or pursue mining, what, what would gener gener generate the greatest value? Again, which can go back and can link it to natural capital accounting. So there are several uh, approaches to, to addressing this issue. It is a serious one for sure. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of questions here really um, about uh, the multinational corporations involved in, in, uh, in mining. So Nicholas King uh, is writing from South Africa and um, he's wanting uh, hard efforts, not just soft guidelines to, protect, to prevent the mining associated violence uh, experienced by local communities when they find themselves fighting uh, both their own governments and multinational mining companies when they don't want mining on their lands and they don't want to be relocated. And uh, Nick King talks about uh, another assassination of an anti-mining social activist uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa. And that relates a bit to what Stefan Gilliam from Austria is writing about the role of large multinational companies in the transitioning of mining governance towards sustainable development. Are they a major barrier to the process or are there also companies that are playing an active role in transforming the governance structures towards better considering the economic, environmental and social implications of mining? So there are two questions about the violence that often seems to happen uh, on the ground and, and whether uh, multinational corporations uh, have, have a positive role to play uh, rather, than, uh, rather than a negative one? Yes, so, I mean, we recognize uh, 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 early in the study that extractive industry can contribute to sustained development. And, and, and in many uh, cases, this is through the uh, work of these multinational companies. And I've also uh, indicated the International Council of Mining uh, and Metals, ICMM, is, is helping countries to internalize what sustained development means in the extractive industry. Um, but uh, this alone, of course, is, is not sufficient. Uh, we, we've, uh, it, I'll, I'll say this 
many of you, I'm sure you've heard of uh, uh, John Ruggie's uh, um, human rights and business uh, framework. I think this is now uh, uh, part of the global compact um, between private sector and, and uh, the UN global compact uh, is, is, is a key uh, pillar. And, and companies and ICMM are helping countries to uh, recognize the importance of human rights and how to uh, uh, administer it, including at the operational level. Uh, and yet, of course, you will have uh, incidents. Uh, Human Bimini is, is one of those cases in, in, in the context, of course, of, of telling uh, uh, that. Um, at the same time, uh, more and more countries are, are, are recognizing, uh, now I'm, I'm going into uh, the transitions, uh, the, uh, the green mind, as it were, and, and, and whether we have uh, champions out there that have, are, are, are breaking new ground. Yes, so uh, there are uh, uh, many companies that um, have recognized the importance of reducing the energy intensity of their activities uh, by, uh, among other things, um, reducing their footprint, uh, um, the, the automation of production uh, of production uh, uh, activities uh, is one of them. So we have driverless driverless uh, vehicles. We have electric, electric vehicles. Uh, so the consumption of diesel and so on is reducing. Uh, um, renewable energy is, 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 is lighting some of these mines. So this is, is increasingly uh, uh, becoming part of, 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 of mining, of, of a modern mine. Um, uh, but uh, I would uh, agree that there is uh, uh, more to be done. Uh, we need and hence the, the need to have this uh, international minerals agency that they are advocating for. Uh, which, among other things, will be responsible for uh, issuing uh, issuing guidance, and, and then uh, together with um, with the, uh, all the stakeholders in the sector, uh, try and, and address the shortcomings. Um, governments need to strengthen their capacity to enforce the, uh, uh, the regulations, and in some cases, of course, uh, punishment is, is is required. But I. I I am in favor of, of continued dialogue so that we find um, uh, solutions to, to this together uh, that will demonstrate uh, what is the value proposition of moving towards a green mind if, it, if ever that concept exists. Over to you. Right, thank you, Pedro. Lots of, lots of difficult things uh, there. You mentioned the International uh, Mineral Agency proposition and uh, Erika van der Linden from the Netherlands has asked uh, a really interesting question about how would the IMA limit price instability? Would it take a role that could be comparable to OPEC in the oil market? So how is it going to intervene in markets to uh, stabilize prices, uh, Pedro? I, I know you're an economist, so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, grist to the mill for you. Well, uh, as you know, uh, the um, commodity price formation, as it were, is informed uh, typically by uh, the demand and supply uh, dynamics. Um, but uh, what has happened late, lately is that we have what we call the financialization of commodities, where um, uh, that particular link is being broken. Uh, where uh, through all sorts of um, uh, processes, uh, artificially prices go up and down, not necessarily because of uh, supply and, de and demand dynamics. So this is one issue that uh, um, needs to be uh, co uh, co taken into consideration. The second is that the um, value of these commodities does not take into full consideration the costs associated with it. Uh, for example, my reference to natural capital accounting, uh, I, I mean, is indeed a, a, a natural capital. It, it's, it indeed takes uh, into consideration 
uh, the, the, the importance of introducing into the cost price formation of our commodities, the costs that are associated uh, with the negative impacts on our natural capital. Uh, and that is uh, something that would require negotiations at the, at the, at the global level. Uh, hence the suggestion uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the establishment of this international minerals agency uh, would, feel, uh, would, would perhaps feel that gap. The appetite to uh, establishing that, um, uh, that particular agency is not obvious. Uh, we believe that this is one thing that may uh, require some organic uh, uh, sort of um, uh, build up uh, if we do not secure the necessary political way, uh, will to, to go straight to its establishment. Perhaps building on some of the things that are uh, already happening at the level of the uh, uh, Intergovernmental um, uh, Forum on Mining and Metals, the IGF. So creating all sorts of, of uh, platforms there that would uh, 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 facilitate continued dialogue. The OECD has this uh, series of dialogues that could perhaps be merged with the IGF. So there are all sorts of, of possibilities there uh, before we, we, we reach at the establishment of the International Minerals Agency. Uh, work, I mean, uh, a little bit just to, to, to justify why we need this. Beyond uh, the issue of uh, uh, stabilization of commodity prices, which is an important uh, uh, aspect, uh, important for um, uh, the, uh, the developing countries. Again, all these booms and busts uh, render these economies, uh, I mean, uh, put these economies in very, very bad situations. If we can stabilize them, uh, the better through uh, some sort of uh, uh, better uh, pricing, uh, some sort of uh, regulatory mechanisms that try and, and, and reduce those fluctuations, um, the involvement of the LMEs of this world, uh, and so on and so forth. But, but also, uh, I would argue, um, uh, through, um, uh, well, what is this now? More um, efforts to retain, uh, to, to strand the, the resources. Uh, this now talks to intergenerational equity. Uh, in, in, in some cases, um, um, the mining might not be necessarily uh, the, the, uh, the best land use option. And you may, be, you may be better off by, by stranding uh, your resources uh, until such time when, uh, of course, would the value or whatever developments, uh, technical, technological and otherwise, uh, would, would uh, justify it. Another reason why we, we, uh, we, we need an international minerals agency as you know, we are going into uh, um, more and more fragile environments because land-based uh, mineral terrains are being depleted, the oil grades are going down. Uh, and of course we have the um, seabed resources which are uh, richer uh, in terms of their grades and content and so on. So there is a growing appetite to go into those, those terrains. Uh, some of you might, might have heard of um, asteroid mining, where uh, already Japan has managed to, to land and a couple of other nations have managed to, map to, to, to land uh, some of, uh, on some of those asteroids. The, the objective there is to bring the asteroids down to an orbit where it will, be, it will make it be commercially viable to, 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 to go and, and mine, uh, among other things, uh, platinum group minerals. And platinum, if, if, that, uh, if we succeed to do that, some of these asteroids have grades which are 500 times richer than the richest uh, um, PGM scenes in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. It means that South Africa would immediately lose its comparative uh, or competitive advantage in PGM. How would you uh, uh, manage that, that major a, a, a problem. Um, so, so you have the out, out of space uh, 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 office 
that uh, regulates that, but it's not there yet in developing relevant governance instruments to arbitrate those kinds of tensions. So this is some uh, of the many other issues that our mineral resources governance introduced to, to all of you, to all of us, just to uh, indicate how complex the sector is and why we need collective action uh, to ensure that we um, promote sustained development in the extractive industry. Uh, I would argue uh, that uh, uh, perhaps we could uh, stop here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I will not be able to, to answer all the questions. Perhaps, um, uh, Paul, uh, if you could send me the questions, then with uh, time I can, I, can, I can answer them on, on, on um, uh, and then perhaps this could be posted. I well, that's an, uh, that's an amazingly... That's an amazingly generous offer, and I'm sure that we can take you up on that. As there's one question that asks you to post the links to the World Economic Forum and World Bank local content guidelines. So there's a questioner who definitely just needs that bit of information. As you say, there are lots of other fascinating problems, but you've been very generous with your time uh, already. Uh, I'm, I apologize to the questioners who haven't had their questions asked. Um, yes, I'm hearing from my organizer here from the meeting that uh, uh, the questions will be emailed over to you, Pedro. So it, it only leaves me to say thank you very much again. Um, to tell everybody that uh, we hope very much that uh, Pedro and I, we're hoping that we're going to be working together on another IRP report, uh, particularly on sustainable finance for uh, minerals extraction. There was a question there we didn't get to from Raphael uh, banker on sustainable finance. I'm sorry about that, uh, Raphael, but, but I hope if you watch this space, um, sometime in the next two years, we'll be producing a report on finance for sustainable minerals production. Um, and otherwise, it only leaves me to say thank you so much, Pedro, for coming to us, uh, for sharing your knowledge. Uh, it's marvelous to think that there are people like you working in Africa uh, from that end uh, to make mining uh, both sustainable and uh, co contributor to development in your continent. And uh, obviously, uh, from our point of view, we would like to do everything to support you and um, enable that to happen. But uh, thank you very much to everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Pedro, for coming and good luck for the rest of the day. And we very much look forward to welcoming everybody to a future seminar at University College London, Institute for Sustainable Resources. So goodbye and thanks again. So Paul, it is for, for this opportunity. Thank you, everyone on the call, for your questions, for, for patiently listening to me. And thank you to Ella, Maija, and everyone for all the technical support that you provided to me. I look forward to more of these conversations. And yes, yes, I will uh, find time to answer your, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Bye-bye.